The LGBT community increasingly contributes in tremendous ways throughout the state, but the history of rights and acceptance in Colorado has not always been easy to access. Hi, I'm John Ferrugia. Homosexuality was categorized as a mental illness in the 1940s. Raids and illegal arrests of those who identified as LGBT presented an ongoing challenge in Colorado communities throughout the 1960s and 70s. While strides have been made, the fight for equality continues today. Discover how a community once ostracized and condemned has now become an integral part of Colorado culture. And now, Colorado Experience, LGBT. I grew up without ever hearing the history of GLBT people in Colorado. LGBT history was by definition an underground history. People didn't talk about it, but it was still heavily criminalized. We've been on the defensive for a very long time, so there hasn't really been time to think about how to go about collecting our history. Nationwide, Denver was one of the leaders. It was one of the first communities that really began to embrace the rights of LGBTs. It's our history that is so important to acknowledge and to gain strength. This program was funded by the History Colorado State Historical Fund. Supporting projects throughout the state to preserve, protect, and interpret Colorado's architectural and archaeological treasures. History Colorado State Historical Fund. Create the future. Honor the past. With support from the Denver Public Library, History Colorado. With additional funding and support from these fine organizations. And viewers like you. Thank you. Colorado's roots extend well before the area was ever considered a territory, never mind a state. Included in this vast history is that of the lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender, or LGBT community. While the terminology may have been different, literature first recognizes this group as Anglos headed west and observed Native American tribes. Different cultures at different times have had different definitions of sexual orientation. In Colorado, American Indian tribes have the term two spirits for people who have biological features for one gender but actually affiliate with another one. For many American Indians, it was an honored form of identity. The Spanish called that berdash, and they used that term generically for American Indians throughout North America. Though westward expansion and the gold rush were often well documented, the LGBT community was written out of American history. Looking back, a story of perseverance and pride has emerged amidst a journey of prejudice and persecution. So if we went back to 1859, there was no LGBT community because that term didn't exist. We can look back at newspaper clipping that talk about what they called then crimes against nature. During the gold rush, there was ample opportunity for men, particularly because there were way more men than women, to have all kinds of relationships. Men were often required to take on roles that were considered feminine, like cooking or cleaning. And when you had a dance and there were no women, they danced together. Does that mean gold miners were homosexual? Well, probably some, but it also meant that they were adapting culturally to the circumstances of the time. There are many stories about women cross-dressing as men to work in the mines. It's not saying that they were lesbian or transgender. They wanted to work, they needed to work, so they dressed as men so that they could work. In the 1800s, it was definitely the law in Colorado that no person should dress not in accordance with their sex. So men should not dress as women and women should not dress as men. Their gender is more policed than sexuality seems to have been. There's a woman named Catherine Frenchy Vospa who may have been what we consider today a transgender man. He arrived in Trinidad, Colorado with a female partner and opened a French restaurant in Trinidad. He came from a well-educated family, spoke several languages. When his wife died, he moved up into the mountains and worked as a sheep herder for years and years. Vospa gets a cold in his 70s after working on this ranch for nearly 40 years. He was very specific about being buried immediately. And it appears that the nuns at the hospital continued to let Grandpa, as they dubbed him, dress himself as a man. His last request was to be, quote, buried in his overalls. Frenchie, for all these years, had actually been a woman who had been passing as a man. And is among a number of many women who gendered themselves as men at this period of time across the West. People came West to reinvent themselves. But it was a dangerous game to play, and people like Frenchie knew that if they were discovered, they would be socially ostracized. There was a community 
underground of homosexual men that got together and hosted parties. And we know this from a professor who wrote a letter in 1894. The author talks about all the people he knows are in this community. He mentions one judge that's gay. He mentions three actors. He mentions several florists. He mentions one student whom he seems to have observed pretty closely. And he goes on to talk about military guys at that. He questioned if they were prostitutes or not, but what he surmised by that is that no, they weren't, that they just needed an outlet to meet other guys. He begins to talk about that as Uranian. At the time, it was thought psychologically that gay people were an intermediate or third sex. There wasn't a lot of stereotypes back then. It was just accepted. They just lived their lives. In the 19th century, homosexual men were, for the most part, closeted, except for those who weren't. Very flamboyant figures like Oscar Wilde, who actually visited Colorado, visited places like Denver and Leadville and gave lectures. For a long time, gay bars were the center of social life for homosexual community. A gay bar is a place where people of the same sex go to hang out and talk to each other. But also a place where they could organize, they could form romantic relationships, either short term or long term. A place that was a private space. The first known gay bar was a Denver bar known as The Pit that opened in 1939. It was down on Colfax and Broadway. It's called The Pit because it's in the basement of a bar. People saw it as a gay bar, it was advertised as a gay bar. My grandfather's brother told me that the Brown Palace was one of the places that men went to meet other men. Specifically, if you were young and cute, you went there to meet an older gentleman, and it was pretty well known around town. After World War II, more gay bars began to open in places like Denver and in other communities in Colorado. And it got to the point where where the armed forces started banning any military personnel from going to these gay bars. The idea was maybe we can regulate the off-duty social behavior of our men if we close down the places where they congregate. And so the, the military did what they could to crack down on gay bars. In the 1950s, the federal government set off on a witch hunt. This event, known as the Lavender Scare, isolated and removed gay and lesbian employees from the federal workforce, setting a precedence for discrimination in the workplace and beyond. Psychiatrists were beginning to define homosexuality as an abnormality, as an illness, in fact. Gays were classified as sociopaths, people who can't help themselves but be criminals. They create something called the Psychopathic Offender Law, which actually says that a person can be locked up indefinitely for being gay. And we were basically an underground for our own protection. I had an aunt who was a lesbian as well, who was one of the first female graduates at the University of Colorado, had returned to Denver to go to med school, and she talked about how closeted they were. It was a very closed and closeted time. Post-World War II, sexuality is policed in Denver. Denver actually transforms its anti-cross-dressing law to target men dressing as women. These laws started to become more common. In Colorado, the police were actively ticketing men who were performing in drag or choosing to dress in the opposite sex. Queer people in 1960s Denver were basically shoved under the ground, a demi -mon. We lived under a heterosexual dictatorship. That's why we were underground. There was a real repression of gay life and lesbian life. We were not free. We begin to see the beginning of the civil rights movement, a post-war movement of African Americans and Hispano and American Indians who are beginning to say, we want to embrace and celebrate our identity. We don't want to be treated as second-class citizens. And of course, that also flowed into the way that homosexuals were treated. The Madison Society is important because it's the first major national group of homosexual people organizing for homosexual people post-World War II. The local Denver area Madison chapter decides in 1959 to have the third national conference in Denver. Instead of using pseudonyms this time, they use their real names. The Denver Vice Squad is in the wings waiting. They arrest the, the leaders of, of Denver area Madison and the whole group gets run out of town and the chapter never recovers. In the 1960s, it started to become an issue to be gay. And all of this came to a head on June 28, 1969. At 1.30 a.m. on June 28, 1969, eight police raided the Stonewall Inn, a gay bar in New York City's Greenwich Village, with the intention of removing sexual deviants from the neighborhood. As the officers began arresting patrons, a crowd of over 400 protesters gathered outside the inn, trapping police and patrons inside, leading to a three-day riot outside of the establishment. This moment has been credited the birth of America's modern LGBT movement. I felt 
finally, that our time has come. The gay liberation movement that, that occurred after Stonewall that leaped over Denver, nothing happened until we formed the Gay Coalition of Denver in 1972. Why am I here when everything is going on in New York and California? My partner at the time came home one day and said, I found a lesbian who wants to form a gay liberation group. So I invited Terry Mangan and Lynn, my partner, and Jane Dundee was a, his friend from Metro. She brought Mary Sassatelli. We had our first meeting. What was like being in that room for our first meeting? Terribly satisfying. <laughs> and uh, we had to figure out a name. And Terry said, the first word has to be gay. Because if people forget our name, they can look it up in the phone book under gay. So, Gay Coalition of Emperor. And besides, it would make us sound a little bigger than five people. We rejected the gay bar culture. We opened up a coffee house called Beyond Lavender. We had certain principles. We would never reveal that someone was gay. Um, we would respect someone who wanted to come in who wanted it not be known that that person was gay or lesbian. And that was like a holy thing. In the 70s, you really started to see the gay community coming together to say, why are we subject to these laws that seem to unfairly impact our community as opposed to other communities. In the first few months of 1973, there was a roundup of gay men. The Denver Police Department initiated a sting operation in 1973 by bringing a tour bus to the state capitol, a place that was known for gay cruising, a bus known as the Johnny Cash Special. That was used to entrap homosexuals with the enticement of having sex. They would come into this bus and then end up being arrested. And they were all illegal arrests because the sodomy law had been repealed the year before. But they had a law offer of good act that they used exclusively against gay men. That was the last straw for Denver's gay community. There was enough momentum to start repealing these laws that had a disparate impact on the gay community. The Gay Coalition mapped out a strategy of attack. The gay community of Denver rallies with the Gay Coalition of Denver. October 23, 1973, we would go to city council at the public hearing. 300 or 350 gays and lesbians fill the chambers, overflow the chambers, and some out into the corridors. We had to wait about four hours before our item on the agenda came up, conveniently at the end. And then the president, Cook, said we only had 30 minutes for our 35 speakers that had signed up. And then he said, there'll be no applause. If you applaud, I will consider that a disturbance of the peace. I got up and gave my speech, which was mainly to show that the law was used exclusively against gay men. It was totally discriminatory. By filing the lawsuit, you see, we were able to look at all the criminal records for the first three months of 73, and we found like 98% were gay men. And we went on for three and a half hours. We not only spoke about the laws that were enforced against gay men illegally, but about our, our lives, who we were as gays and lesbians. The Denver City Council agreed that homosexual men and women should have the right to have the same displays of public affection as heterosexual men and women that they shouldn't be arrested for kissing in public the same way that a man and a woman might kiss. As a result of that hearing, they repealed four anti-gay laws. And that was a major watershed moment in Colorado, a moment where the LGBT community could begin to see progress in their organization and their protest for basic civic and civil rights. It opened up the closet doors a bit. It also said you were no longer speechless. Even though we got the court order and got rid of some laws, how did that affect the average person struggling through his life and getting over the trauma of being kicked out of his home by his parents, being subjected to heterosexual men attacking them? And I said, well, you know, what am I doing? We, we need a gay community soon. In the aftermath, Jerry Garash founds Unity in 1975. Unity eventually leads to the creation of the center. The GLBT Community Center of Colorado has been in existence for 40 years. So it really was a crisis center in the beginning. People came to us when they had nowhere else to go. You end up with a group of people who are really fighting for change and basically saying enough is enough. We're here, we're queer, get used to it. 
In celebration of this accomplishment, Colorado's LGBT community finally felt safe organizing the state's first unofficial Pride rally, a gay inn at Denver's Cheeseman Park. A gathering of 50 commemorated the anniversary of the Stonewall Riots and celebrated the Gay Coalition of Denver's success. There was no march, there were no banners, but we felt we had to do something. The first gay pride parade in Denver was in 1975. The organizers didn't realize they needed a permit for this, so 200 people showed up. The police were like, no, you can't just march down the street, so they ended up marching down the sidewalks. 1976, they officially organized the first parade with permits so that people marched down the streets from Cheeseman Park to the Capitol building and then back. I stood on the street corner and watched Pernell Steen and his orc and his little band go down the street on the back of a pickup truck. In those early days, it was about a movement, a gay rights movement. If the LGBT community embraced a new sense of unity and pride in the 1970s, the 1980s brought the greatest challenge yet. The HIV AIDS epidemic reinforced hateful stereotypes while inflicting devastating casualties among the LGBT community. In the early 80s, Denver was a pretty open scene. It really broke loose. It got very wild and very sexual energy everywhere. A new phenomenon began to affect the LGBT community, not just in Colorado, but nationwide. 1983 is when reports of these rare diseases that hadn't been seen started to surface. These reports were coming out of New York City and San Francisco. And soon after that, we started to hear about a gay cancer, uh, pneumonia, and people started dying. In 1985, the slogan for a Pride Parade was Alive in 85, because this is when what would become known as AIDS really hit the gay community hard. If I wasn't taking care of my best friend and planning their funeral, you were taking care of your best friend. And it was incredibly sad. AIDS hit me personally early on. A friend of mine was, I think, the second man to die in Colorado from AIDS. Within a year of that, I'd probably lost four or five more friends. So it began to snowball, and the paranoia took a long time to hit. This is a period of time when you begin to see dozens and dozens of obituaries, and dozens and dozens of people dejected from their families, and dozens and dozens of gay men dying every single month. The general sense was shock and despair. And at first, healthcare providers weren't wanting to touch people who had this disease. People were scared. The angst about it and the anger and the hate was really focused at gay men. I don't think they knew that anybody else could get it because that was the only group that was hosting the disease at that point in time. The Colorado Department of Public Health in the 1980s was required to collect the names of anybody who had tested HIV positive. And this law was really put forth under this notion of partner notification. And anybody had access to this list. Insurance companies, employers, people would be denied their health insurance, that their health insurance would be dropped. This was well before we had a lot of laws that protected medical confidentiality. It was a delicate balancing act of wanting to prevent the spread of HIV, but at the same time protect people who were most at risk. And as more and more people began to die, the community responded. The one thing that AIDS did do is it brought the, the male and the female community together. That had been somewhat separate before. A lot of the women were the ones who stepped up to help with caregiving and volunteering in hospices and food delivery programs. We took care of our, our friends and our brothers. Well, at the end of the 80s and into the 90s, people were still dropping like flies. Well, we watched our community members die for 15 years. It was a very, very sad and disheartening time in our history. It felt like the LGBT community had gone through a war. Then in Colorado, as we were dealing with AIDS and the repercussions from AIDS. We also had Amendment 2 to deal with. In the early 1990s, an organization called Colorado for Family Values moved its headquarters to Colorado Springs. They were hearing gay people start to ask for equal access and equal rights. And they began pushing very hard for an amendment to the state constitution, which stripped away what they called special privileges to homosexuals. The actual language of the amendment was very confusing. Many people wore buttons, no on to, no on to, because that's the way you wanted to vote. Amendment 2 meant that gay and lesbian people would never 
have equal rights in the state of Colorado. They would be denied equal rights. And voters passed Amendment 2 in 1992 by a fairly wide margin. The community was extremely heartbroken, angered. Here we are in the midst of an AIDS epidemic, and then this. I was a principal at this time and pretty openly gay. I saw that the school where I worked in Arapahoe County had voted 98% for Amendment 2. And I've never been so struck personally by something that I couldn't even wrap my arms around. It became very personal very quickly and a bit scary. I was worried about the families, about parents, about disturbing the education of kids over something that really didn't matter, but other people thought it did. Colorado is now known as the hate state. People refused to vacation here. Madonna refused to play any shows here, which she didn't do for almost 20 years. The TV show Frasier was supposed to take place in Denver until this happened, and then they changed the setting to Seattle. Suddenly, the community came together again and said, we have to do something about this. In 1990, the official numbers for Pride Fest were 5,000. In 1991, it was 15,000, because people came out in protest of Amendment 2. In 1992, once it passed, the numbers jumped up to 30,000. The GLBT community came out of that moment more unified because people were mobilized for action and for change. The mayor of Denver at the time said no. I don't support this. Colorado doesn't support this. We will not uphold this in Denver. The same thing happened in Boulder. Even though it was passed by voters, some politicians in Colorado said, we are not going to support this. So the community came together and brought on an attorney by the name of Gene Dubofsky. The Colorado Supreme Court put a permanent injunction on Amendment 2, and so it never actually went into effect in Colorado. And from there, it was appealed all the way up to the United States Supreme Court in the case of Romer versus Evans. They stated that gays and lesbians are protected by the 14th Amendment. That law was overturned by the United States Supreme Court. And at that time, there had really not been a Supreme Court case that dealt with LGBT civil rights in a positive manner. So it was a joyous time in our history, and it meant that we could move forward as people and be recognized as citizens in our own country. Despite the victory over Amendment 2, the fight for equal rights and equal protection was far from over. The hate-motivated murders of Matthew Shepard in Wyoming in 1998 and Angie Zapata in Greeley in 2008 revealed continuing anti-gay hostility, even as new state laws reinforced LGBT rights. I don't think a lot of people realize how much Colorado has helped to shape LGBT civil rights across the nation. In 2008, the Sexual Orientation Employment Discrimination Act was passed, and that essentially added sexual orientation and transgender status to the list of protected classes in Colorado's anti-discrimination statute. So now, you cannot be fired because of your LGBT status, you cannot be denied a rental space, and you cannot be denied access to a public accommodation. 2009, Colorado passed the Designated Beneficiary Law, and this was actually the first in the country, and that was really important for the LGBT community who could not get married but still wanted to bestow inheritance rights and medical decision-making to partners. In 2013, Colorado passed the Civil Union Act which was huge for the gay community. And I think it gave us a sense of power that we may not have had previously to deal with the next issue that might come because you always know there was going to be one. But the only thing was this still wasn't as equal as marriage. And many were upset because it wasn't gay marriage and they weren't going to participate, they weren't going to bother with civil union. I got arrested for trying to get married. We went down one day and, and we went into the marriage office and we got in front of the counter and asked the young woman working there, said my partner and I are here to apply for a marriage license and I felt so f sorry for this kid because you could see the horror on her face. And so here's this kid sitting there with my license going, I can't under Colorado issue you a license, you are a same-sex couple, and I'm sorry. And I said, well, thank you. And by this time, a young straight couple had come up, and it was so obvious. You move aside so this couple can come get the service. Two years later, the United States Supreme Court found that denying homosexuals the right to marriage was unconstitutional, and that changed everything. Now we're no different than anyone else, <laughs> and that was kind of a... That's kind of an, a downside of any movement that's worked so long to get somewhere, is now what do we do? It was a very validating moment to feel like you are 
one of one of the citizens of the country with, with rights to marry the person that you love. It was amazing. While steps have been made for the LGBT community, there are still large strides to be made for equality. I think as a whole, yes, we have made progress. Are we more accepting today than we were 50 years ago? Certainly. People now can be out at work. We do have laws. That doesn't always mean that employers follow them. There's still an awful lot of work to be done. But I think we are, we are slowly getting there. We have to not give up. We had to lose some battles in order to win the battles down the road. And if we had given up on that first loss, who knows where we would be today. Transgender rights are the new civil rights movement. So even though we've made all these strides, it's not enough until you can walk down the street in any part of this country without fear. History is this connection to the past. And living through Amendment 2 and all these moments, you have a chance not simply to become a part of history, but to change it. LGBT community in Denver and in Colorado is, is vibrant and very active. We're change makers, we're artists, and creating better lives for people in the state. We spawned a movement to seek gay rights and to improve our lives by doing away with our oppression and getting rid of oppressive laws and advancing favorable laws. Colorado went from being the hate state to one of the best states to live in the United States. We can come together as a community. We've legislated, but we haven't changed the hearts. And the places where we need to change the hearts are where I think the next work will be the biggest. We have to continue to advocate for our rights and for our equality. It's not going to be handed to us. If the suffering and the sorrow and the triumph and tribulation means anything, it means people can have better lives. So we have to be perseverant and we have to tell our stories. It's important to tell our stories and value the lives, value our lives. And if our stories endure, then our identity endures.